Um, it, it's accessing memory. It's accessing experiences uh, that were the impetus behind the songs. And yeah, they were written at a certain period, you know, a certain age when I probably wasn't, didn't have the, the life experience to be able to articulate what was going on, but intuitively I knew. I couldn't quite articulate myself or what my experience was. I didn't, I didn't have an academic life. I mean, I left school at 17. I just turned 17. I went straight in the army for a month, which was insane. <laughs> and then back <laughs> out of the army. Yeah. And then, and, and, you know, being a punk rock kid, I was just like, then I was on the street just running around. But, uh, it stays with you. It's part of your persona. It's part of your DNA. And there's an element of that in everything the cult's done, all the incarnations or things that I've done outside of the cult, whether it's, you know, the doors or uncle or, you know, um, performing blacks, performing um, Lazarus with Mike Garson. I mean, whatever else, it's still the same dude uh, with my lived experience. And then, but you're just accessing different parts. I mean, you're a yoga practitioner, so you know about uh, ego dissolution, and then you're just accessing what is and going to acceptance of that, and you let it come through and you use that. Um, I'm not when, when you yeah. when you Sorry. when you return when you return to the songs, you know, like the first rehearsals or going back to them. Do you find they uh, have a different meaning to you now, or do you, or do you actually go back into that period of time, into that kind of, you know, that kind of, like you say, it's, it's half form the ideas, but that which is what's the beauty of youth, isn't it? And yeah. is that some, so is it somewhere in the middle of those two, or is it one or the other? Mm, probably a bit of both. Um, I mean, I've been changing some lyrics, like real subtle changes to lyrics. I've noticed, oh, yeah, I was repeating that verse over and over again. I should flip this around, change this phrase to bring it more in line with current, you know, I've changed a few things. I haven't changed the essence of what I was talking about in the songs, like Christians. I mean, Christians about imperialism and, you know, kind of growing up in... Um, industrial britain 60s 70s still factories still the industrial revolution is rolling still that sort of sense of you know the empire um yeah you know you grow up with that i remember reading british empire magazine when i was a kid and i was fascinated by all these where the footprint was of 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 britannia and the subjugation of so many people to so the good advance our civilization, our culture, at the expense of others. And that obviously didn't sit right with me uh, as an individual. And definitely a lot of us at the time felt the same way as we were coming to this awakening that what we've been taught to adhere to the working, you know, the working class, the class system, all of it was just not going to work in the 21st century. <laughs> It's like yeah. medieval extension, medieval extension, you know, extension of medieval uh, constructs. Um, but thank God that, you know, the Godhead that um, Eastern cultures start coming in, Eastern spiritual technologies, I think, start to open up a lot of people's perceptions, doors of perception, Aldous Huxley, you know, even Carlos Castaneda, psychedelics, and then Eastern philosophy. Um, so having now several decades of of being a seeker and practitioner and I've been able to look at these songs and kind of have a better way to articulate the essence of each song. Like somebody asked me, what is death cult? Yeah. And I think the first thought was impermanence. Yeah. From, but from Buddhist context, it's impermanence. It's recognizing that there is a culture around death. There is a culture around um, that things don't last. We tend, my observation is that the culture drives itself. It eats it. So it's like an Ouroboros. It eats itself with the, with the illusion that it's, it's eternal when in fact it isn't, you know, it's, it's of the moment. And, 
Death Cult came out of very spontaneous punk rock ethos as as well documented you know i was part of the crass tribe for a moment and they were incredibly important and parallel to them was bowie with his philosophical when you start peeling away the layers of his songs and seeing the source material whether it was tibetan buddhism or nietzsche or you know um afro-paganism whatever he was into um so uh, yeah so, so bowie kind of planted the seeds did he and punk through the question marks yeah. and the following dec- decades for a lot of people in our generation was trying to find the answers to those questions do you think we ever did find the answers or, or are we still on that trail are we still like throwing those question marks around great observation john that's that's a brilliant observation i think we're still far- throwing the question marks around especially in the west well, even in the east i mean you know, not everybody in in the, in the East or the Middle East, the Middle East, Far East is enlightened. They may have enlightened aspects of their culture, whether it's you know yoga practices or Buddhist practices. But in essence, many humans are disconnected and in a state of existential chaos within themselves, and um, so much easier to go with the current tabloid narrative you know just stay in stay in lane let somebody else do the thinking and exploring but that's where artists come in you know artists i mean i use the term very loosely because everybody's an artist now right Uh, or recently you know a four-year-old that learns to ride a bicycle is a rock star or an accountant an accountant's a rock star like he's like a rock star what does that mean (laughs) what are we what are we talking about here what what defines a rock star so in a sense, it's, it's also, it's not just reconvening, say, your own music. It's actually trying to reconvene what rock and roll is and make a sense. Does it even have a place in modern culture? Does it have yeah. a reason to be here? Absolutely. I feel that live performance of the moment in the instant, that's something intangible. You, people come in a room, we gather, we commune, something euphoric happens. And we leave and we're elevated or we're expanded or we've our our life experience is enhanced. That continues. I mean, that was the core of punk rock. Was we made it happen ourselves as a community. Yeah. You know, uh, individuals coming together in community and certainly Malcolm McLaren conducting the orchestra. Um, he gave some really good framework, him and, and Vivian, especially the you know, visual elements as well as some of the philosophical elements and then maybe some more refined points coming through artists like i mean there's so many to mention from ian curtis to crass were on a you know a similar looking at similar material but interpreting it in a different way and then all the the culturalism that we had coming in especially in the uk in the 70s and the 80s like you know uh music like reggae for example coming in and how important peter tosh was or how important bob marley was you know or the clash pulling it together we're talking about civil rights we're talking about community we're talking about communing uh, what we have in common rather than what separates us and and maybe it's a throw over from the 60s or the absolute the beginners in the 50s or the the romanticists in the 19th century and, be, and before that, the classicists, um, it continues. It continues and it's evolving and it's going to transmorph and we can call it whatever whatever tag you want to put in it. I mean, punk rock. Who, I mean, you're definitely somebody who's given this great amount of consideration and I'm sure that, especially with your yoga practice, you could see the transient or the the impermanent nature of just labeling a moment and it stays there because in actual fact that's an illusion it's yeah. not 1978 yeah. we couldn't recreate 1978 if we tried so you know? so in a sense when you go back and you're doing death cult and even some death cult an early cult this is not an attempt to recreate something as a carbon copy of that time. This is no, a no, no. 2023 version of those songs. No, it's almost like 
and you know an artist might use a different medium and say i'm going to use this now to put over whatever's going on and the choice now was death cult it's like let's put it through that lens and see what happens because death cult now is a live band it's a completely different live band but the essence of the songs is still there if not more intensified and typically for us we fall into the moment by happenstance i don't know we just fall into this moment the subject material we're talking about what's happening in the world right now um the levels of violence and malevolence um the levels of covetousness you know um of individual power over another individual no i mean that's something that we were very aware of certainly being around crass was really important for me because those guys were a community and they came from different walks of life yet they're all pulling in a direction for um to break that bondage that human bondage of systems that have been thrown onto us whether it's language gender whatever you know getting to the essence of what it was to be a human being and they did it in their way and um i'm very grateful that they exist and i got to experience them in that moment because i've honestly gone back to to sitting in dial house and being given um black elk speaks but i think eve gave it to me to read while those guys were having a meeting <laughs> they were yeah. i just turned up yeah. i turned up at the house but they gave me a book to read yeah on, indig on, in, on, on american indigenous culture and they were about that they were about turning people on to pieces of information and we all were in many ways we were all into like check this out check this out you know it wasn't like instagram link like here we go it's like here's a book you know tactilely physically sit down have the experience of reading it and then we discuss it and then we implement it into our yeah, creative processes this is one of the great things about Bowie as well. Before one of the interviews were literally a crash course for the Ravers, were they? You know, it's, as yeah. he sang himself, they were they were hinting at ideas and possibilities beyond the norm, what we knew, beyond top of the pops, weren't they? And do you see yeah. that your role is, is kind of as, as a child of Ziggy, which basically we all are, really? Yeah, is an ongoing part of that process. Yeah, I, I definitely drank the Kool Aid when yeah. I was ten. You know, listening to Life on Mars, <clears throat> buying Life on Mars at 10, and and that being my entry, my true entry point. I mean, even though I've kind of grown up in Merseyside with the Beatles and everything, I was a little bit too young for the 60s, but the early 70s was the first time I really became conscious of this being part of my psyche. This music is a part of me. This information is a part of me. I will respond to life based upon this source of information which was coming from Bowie and then everything else you saw that he was either a part of an influencer of or a inspired by <clears throat> so many different cultural aspects and I almost had two sides of the coin because <clears throat> I was 11 when I left the UK and I went to Canada and we're only 40 miles from the US border so <laughs> I had a, you know, UK perspective on culture and whatever, esoteria. And, and I got to the United States and then all of a sudden there's all this other information coming in, which was actually informing a lot of the artists. Like the kids were getting it from, I guess, TV, radio, you know, print, uh, music, print magazines, whatever. Cultural was coming in that way. Whereas going to North America, 50 channels of color tv it was i mean sure. fm it was fm radio it was it was um you know seeing david bowie on soul train or or seeing the new york dolls and don krishna's rock concert and direct direct to that plus the record stores were huge like i lived in hamilton ontario but there was still there's like about 10 or 10 or 12 major record shops you could walk in, they were like, everything was represented there. Every single 
the Sam the Record Man was one of the chain stores in Canada. And it was in print. They could get it for you. Plus, the people behind the counter are pretty knowledgeable. So, you know, if you like this, you might like this. They might rec- make, make a recommendation. But that dual kind of thing that gave you a unique cultural perspective, I think, you know, that yeah. you could... Uh, you could appreciate Ace DC and Led Zeppelin as as art in a way the post punk generation initially didn't, you know, and you were kind of ahead of the game with that. And you could use that music as a platform for the ideas, putting more ideas, maybe lyrical ideas, than AC DC had, but using that vehicle. And that's what the call was, really, wasn't it? It was the esoteric well, with, with the rock and roll, wasn't it? <clears throat> for, for a moment, I mean, in terms of AC DC, that was a moment. That was like 25, 24 year olds who were touring intensely intoxicated uh, pirate ship. And that was the music spoke to us in that moment. It was, they weren't like tours, they were like deployments. And, that, and those were the, those were the uh, psychic weapons that we needed at that moment. And the look and the, the energy and the, you know, I guess the way we were putting it over. But then, that only lasted a certain moment, even though it's still in our DNA. You know, I can I can definitely go into that. I mean, I was a loved Bon Scott. At the same time, I loved the Clash and the Pistols, and um, thought he's incredible performer, incredibly charismatic. Billy actually saw him on the night he passed away in Camden. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. out and about, and he died. He fixated in the car, but. Yeah. Uh, alcohol, from alcohol and I don't know pills maybe, but uh, ACDC are kind of a yeah a fragment of the cult's DNA, but I think the real bedrock of the cult is Bowie's Esoteria Chameleon. It's so much easier to say Bowie is just a chameleon. It was superficial. It was he was changing skins no this guy was immersed in it i mean he drank the he drank the kool-aid he drank the water he tasted it so he spoke from experience whereas many few other artists were just emulating a certain ethos or whatever or you know a way of being that was pushed by media um you know i read no one here gets out alive pretty much when it came out and that was one of my Bibles, you know, going through that and then looking at Morrison's influences and then all the tributaries that came off that, whether it was uh, UCLA film school or, you know, Greek mythology or um, looking at indigenous cultures and shamanism and transformative psychedelic experiences and all of that was in that book. And then jumping off stages and confronting authority and, you know, being a bit gobby, just saying yeah. stuff off the cuff. Unedited. Which you, unedited. Yeah, which I see. You retain yeah. in the live show to the stage. You know, you, you do sometimes confront the audience, give it a little poke, try and wake people up, isn't it? I, like, I saw your time before last time. I saw last time I saw you. It's a piece on Halifax. Time before the arena with Alice Cooper. A little, little bit of confrontation goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's presented to you. Right in your face, right in your face, and you see it. And it's like where there's a blockage of energy in the room. Something's going on with an individual or a little group of people, and you think this is a dark spot. It's affecting the entire uh, holistic experience. And um, usually, you get an energetic shot from, like, I had one couple that was sitting when we were playing with Alice Cooper at the O2 and they were sitting in the seats defiantly just kind of arms folded glaring at me yeah. like glaring like you know really intense and I just looked at them and I was like what is going on here and I said like I mean they were obviously there not to see us but I said it's totally cool you guys can be whatever way you want I understand that but then I got a bit provocative. I said, uh, I understand you're uncomfortable. 
that maybe was a little bit too into maybe that was too intimate yeah you know um but at that point guy got out of his seat started ranting making violent gestures towards me and um the girl he was with was kind of beside herself and and people around you could see you could feel the energy shift it was an energetic shift and eventually i left him be because he was in his, in his having his experience and, and it was distracting from the collective but occasionally i mean you get things like that it shows we had a brawl in las vegas recently which i closed down pretty quickly but that's just something you can't handle their alcohol consumption or whatever else yeah. you're doing or they get yeah. nervous in a crowd people get nervous in crowds especially post covid it was really interesting going and playing post covid usa wow it's almost like people didn't know how to be together again in a room that kind of intimacy yeah, yeah going to yeah. gigs just afterwards was odd being in the audience yeah so yeah being in the audience i was going to gigs i was in the audience and it felt awkward and uncomfortable You're around people you know it's as safe as it calls it it was definitely yeah. an energy of definitely an energy but um i feel it's it's getting better um so but i don't think we're past it it's so musically musically going back to playing death call and stuff do you feel physically different you know even to the extent of how you would move on a stage you know and how to make your body react you know physically mentally and spiritually because it's quite a lot of it's quite i mean obviously you can see the line running through all the bands but it's quite different than like rhythmically and sonically isn't it yeah yeah totally um it is different of course it's different um bodies my body's been trashed <laughs> you know <laughs> i've been off pa stacks i've been off stages i've hit concrete been hit by cars been knocked out <clears throat> my body's taken a few shots but the adrenaline that comes through these songs the 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 emotional intelligence of these songs kind of drives it and it drives you and it pushes me physically and um definitely emotionally it pushes me emotionally because i'm not one to do things by half measures i choose to go when i was a kid i was a pretty good middle distance runner so i was able to pace myself and i've been able to take that into performing you know as much as you do yoga practice and you know you can only stay in a certain posture for a certain amount of time before it starts to become unbearable or you have a cathartic breakthrough and so in many ways performing to me is almost like a yoga practice it's a form of devotion and prayer and there's something more than the physical experience that that occurs and i'm looking for that nuance and you get a few hints i mean you've got the material you've got an arrangement you've got a set you've got a lyric you're speaking in an english language <clears throat> there's a few things that are set but within that you start playing with you start playing with it and trying to get to a different uh, yoga is a great analogy because you know when you're in a pose and you've got a certain injury or whatever you're trying to move through it um you breathe through it you mm. breathe you breathe you breathe and you allow it to release and there's so much honestly feel that a lot of artists i don't know what the right term is to say um performers that die at such early ages are unable to um drop the preconceived notion that you're going to be 27 for the rest of your life sure yeah. you've got to adapt to changes in the body changes in the environment the physical health uh, relationships all of it so what we bring what what we bring to the performances us now and it's not like i haven't taken the time out to go look at be inquisitive and go look at it and learn more about the experience of sentience and you know and again i will say this no better than no less than just that i'm inquisitive so but that's me not if there's no rules if somebody's at our show and they're obviously struggling and having a rough time i might get them into a safer position 
you know, say, hey, do you want to stand over here or be in this position? <laughs> some people, um, individuals at shows are so, you can see, some people are like euphoric and full of joy, and then you can see that one individual who's <clears throat> definitely having some sort of existential crisis. Whatever's going on, you don't know what's going on. Who knows what's going on within an individual? And um, you know that you can't individually just work on that person or or your connection or relationship, your karmic relationship to that individual. You have to work with the collective group and eventually you see them lightening up or they're able to kind of fall out of their heads with the consciousness, self-consciousness. And it becomes about yes. the moment, the performance. And, and there's something that's unquantifiable. We can talk about it forever. Mm. But being in it, being in it, is is the ultimate experience that intimacy that connectedness being with your tribe gives you a sense of purpose a sense of belonging a sense of meaning um which is bloody hard in this world <clears throat> yeah you know you can't just pick a football team and that's it because football teams are incredibly diverse you know I mean, when yeah. When you got re immersed in the songs, what, what, what do you think? What are you thinking about the young Ian? You know, like as an older version now, what, what would you tell that guy who wrote those lyrics to those songs years ago? Mm. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You're going to get through this. You're going to get through this moment. Um, the choices that you make will define the person you're going to be later and you're making good choices and you're not infallible. You will make mistakes. You will make errors. You will be transgressive, but then you'll recalibrate. You'll get back to center and only by going to the edge or over the edge, you know where that is. So um, stay with it. Just stay with it. And, um, I never saw some of the traps that were going to come along when I was younger because I had no concept of fame or iconic state. And I didn't even, never registered with me that, you know, the term pop star was thrown around. David Bowie was a pop star and Curtis was a pop star. Bob Marley was a pop star. So diversely different. Um, and then somebody says, now you're a pop star. I was like, what does that mean? It means you're a popular, <laughs> yeah. you're a popular artist at this moment. Um, and it looks great on the cover of uh, Oh Boy or Smash Hits or whatever. Um, but I definitely, I feel connected to my 19, 20 year old. Right now I feel really connected. <clears throat> and that kid was carrying a lot. That kid was carrying a lot. It was my experience, it was my burden, it was my karmic burden to carry. However, I got to where I got to, but I'd had a lot of, a lot of life had gone into that that kid, and I was making some heavy observations. A lot of the media were not having it. There's like this kid can't have read Camus. It's yeah. impossible. Yeah. How can he possibly process that? We have because we've been to university. <laughs> my university, was... my university was the street. You know. Yeah. There's such a, I mean, because people forget this, but because you came from such a DIY background, it's not, there was no show business there at all, was it? It's just a bunch of, initially, just a bunch of kids rehearsing in a cellar in Bradford. Yeah. No manager, just uh, just working yeah. it out as it went along. Yeah. We were just like kids working it out. And um, I think Barry went to college. Buzz was an art student incredibly gifted artist um but we were just working out it was, it was kismet that we came together and when we did and the place we came together and um, how diverse and multicultural bradford is in that area um had a huge impact on me as well but we were four individuals pulling in different directions and we could always see the fractures appearing but we were just trying to work it out we're trying to work out a lot of it was What's, what is happening and why is it happening so quickly because there was times when we just wanted to turn it off and like can we slow this down a bit because it was overwhelming yeah. 
Sudden Death Cult, especially because Sudden Death Cult went from zero to you know big big five opening for the Chelsea at the Marquee. You know, sounds sounds did a review. I have seen the future in it. Sudden Death Cult. That happened in a really short space of time. I definitely wasn't prepared for it as an individual. And perhaps if I had a little bit more emotional maturity and we had some mentorship around us, a little bit better container around us, some death cult may have gone on. But we didn't. We were in a really challenging environment as individuals and collectively as a group. There was a lot of pressure put on us. And everybody was looking for the successes to, you know, Ian Curtis had recently passed. Pistols had imploded. The clash of it were imploding. Everybody was looking for, like, what's next? Who's going to be the next? Who's going to pick up the, ba the, the banner? And a lot of pressure was put on some death call. No way to be that, you know? And we could have been that. But I think it would have imploded. I couldn't see it maybe going more than an album or two albums. So I made the choice, the individual choice, that I, want, I knew I wanted to continue with music. But I knew I didn't want it to be a flash in the pan. Right? You have this moment, and then that's the rest of your life. Because I was reading a lot of musical biographies about artists that had had longer careers and or a, a longer life in creativity and and artists, uh, visual artists as well. I mean, I gave myself over to that as opposed to oh, we've been offered a hundred thousand pounds from CBS Records, which we. We were, we were on the doll. I mean, there was a point when I wasn't even on the doll, I was just scrounging. Um, and then, you know, within a very short period of time, there's CBS records throwing 100 grand at us. It's like, what? What is that? But it's only money. It didn't, you know, the personalities that it came with and the institutions it came with, I was like, no, that's, that's not it. That's not it. I want to be with my family. I want to be with my community. I want this to evolve. That earnestness has never left me. I still feel the same way. I live a pretty modest existence. You know, I wouldn't say I was highly materialistic. There's certainly some material possessions I covet, but, you know, it's like there are seditionaries boots. <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> some, yeah, yeah. Like some of my old, some of my old seditionaries or bits of World's End or a um, few bits of art that I've got that I've, I've got a post that's signed by Francis Bacon. I'm like, yeah, that's. I'm running out the house. I'm grabbing those Seds boots, <laughs> yeah. and, and that World's End frock coat, and that's it. You know, um, well, it, it took a hell of a maturity at that age to walk away from something that was on a rocket ride. You know, I think that was quite a brave decision. It was impulsive. It was impulsive, and I mean, I have so much gratitude to Buzz Barry and Aki. I really do. They were. They gave me an opportunity to to fulfill my path, my journey, whatever. But hopefully, collectively, we had an experience together where that enhanced their life experience. I mean, they went on to do Getting the Fear, which were remarkable as well. B was incredible. I thought in many ways, that to me looked more like what they should have been, you know, was with B as the singer. Because, I mean, incredible looking guys, but also what they were into. Um, mm. musically and creatively it seemed like a better fit in some ways I actually sang with Get, Get In The Fear I got up and sang with them uh, yeah uh, in London where was it like some polytechnic in London yeah, um, I think it was there's still a lot of love there I mean there's there's definitely a lot of love I'm sure there's a lot of are we going to be seeing uh, any of those guys turning up for the uh, tour I don't know we haven't really been in contact I think pandemic we would occasionally I'd hit up Buzz, DM each other. Um, he's an incredible ceramicist, incredible artist. I love his work. Um, I haven't seen Aki for many years. I haven't really communicated with Barry for many years. I mean, we did have we did have a get together probably about probably over a decade now. We sat down. We actually rehearsed. We played the songs. And uh, we were sitting near Edgeware Road, probably in an Indian place, talking about, do you think we should? And that moment didn't seem right mm. at that moment. 
And who knows? Never say never. Never say yeah. never. If there's a willingness and there was a desire, then perhaps 